Hello. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the presentation. Today I will talk about buying time, latency versus bidding in fair transaction ordering. This is a joint work together with Mahim Nakelkar, who is PhD student at Cornell University. Jan Christoph Schlegel, who is senior lecturer at City University of London, and recently he joined Flashbots. And Edward Felton, who is uh, co-founder and uh, chief scientist at Offchain Labs. And I'm from Offchain Labs doing research there. So motivation is a tran transaction ordering policy, which is one of the biggest questions in blockchains, especially with, with the rise of DeFi. And we know from the traditional finance that they are maintaining order books and they are matching uh, buy and sell orders. And their policy is first come, first serve. And this is the same policy for all roll-up protocols that I'm aware of. And in the case of traditional finance, it is uh, enforced by law that this is the only policy. We know that Ethereum is a big uh, problem, that there is a lot of front-running and back-running sandwich attacks happening because uh, there is one block writer for each block which can choose the transactions from the mempool and also the ordering of it. And this is then exploited by them. And transactions include bids or tips, but in case of rollups, we don't have this. And we are proposing to change that. So there are a lot of advantages to first come, first serve. Uh, first of all, it's the simplest probably, and it's easy to explain to anyone. It also sounds fair. Whoever is fastest gets executed fastest, and it minimizes the latency. There is nothing faster you can do, just receive the transaction and uh, execute it, or put it in the uh, execution. But it comes with some disadvantages also, and the biggest disadvantage is, is that it creates the latency competition. So. Uh, transaction senders are trying hard to be fast. And in case of traditional finance, we know that there is this whole industry, high frequency trading, and it uh, constitutes more than half of the exchange volume. So it's a hu huge business. And in case of blockchains, it was acknowledged only very recently in 2020 in Flashbots paper. And then there is a company Flashbots around, around that too. So we think that uh, it's only the front running that is a bad activity and we want to prevent it. But back running is a good activity because it corrects the price in the DeFi on uh, automated market makers and we can support it. Or whoever wants uh, to get that arbitrage opportunity should be able to or whoever has the highest value for it. Okay, so this latency racing also exists in rollups because it's uh, all of them use first come, first serve um, policy. And we notice that parties spend resources to get closer to the sequencer. And uh, the problem is that parties with more resources have always an advantage, so they always win all the races. And this is problem because they are not necessarily the ones that, ha that value the transaction fast inclusion the most. So it can be someone who has less resources, but better algorithm or, or yeah, better um, liquidity on different, in different pools and can extract more value. So it's also inefficient. And from the protocol perspective, it's complete waste because they spend resources to um, pay, I don't know, Amazon servers or some other servers or improve their internet, but the, no re resources goes to protocol. And one example that was observed on Arbitrum is that parties create uh, nodes, a lot of nodes, and connect it to sequencer for the feed just to get feed faster than others because sequencer uses the fair uh, f feed policy, which is random. So whoever has more nodes has higher probability to, to get the feed faster. And these too many nodes, unnecessary nodes, slow down the sequencer. So this is also a problem for the rollups. And of course, it would be much better if these resources, or at least part of it, captured by the protocol. 
and this could uh, be used later to subsidize the regular transaction fees or used for the maintenance and improvement of the in infrastructure. So there are a lot of properties that we ask for the new proposal. So first two of them are more informal. So we want to have good properties that first come first serve has, which is uh, low latency, of course, and some level of transparency. And we want to reduce the waste that is caused by latency raising. More formally, we want to maintain a dark mempool so transactions are not, transaction details are not visible until they are already scheduled. And once they are scheduled, then there, there is no problem. So we want low latency. So we don't want to uh, make transactions, especially regular transactions, wait a lot. So once the transaction is submitted and received by sequencer, it should only take some short time bound to be executed. So one more property that is maybe more exotic, it's uh, independence of irrelevant transactions. And this means that we don't want two different races to interact with each other. So any complicated algorithm that uh, you may come up with, uh, we can prove that this will have this problem that it won't be independent of irrelevant transactions. So different races will affect each other. Also we are looking for the algorithm that is easy to decentralize. So it's uh, stable after decentralization. So it should not be uh, s something very complicated. And actually, it turns out that third and six are coming together in the dark mempool solution, which we achieve by maintaining a committee of sequencers and threshold encryption. So for that, we need to have some number of sequencers. And this needs to be typically low number. So between seven and 16, we are thinking. Also, we need to have this threshold encryption decryption. So every sequencer only holds some uh, share of the secret key. And we need uh, some threshold of them to come together to decrypt the transaction uh, contents. So we want it to be Byzantine fault tolerant, namely assume that sequencers can be arbitrarily malicious and network to be asynchronous. So the only assumption is that once the transaction is sent, it will be delivered at some point, but we don't make any assumptions about uh, how long it will take. Of course, higher end gives us more security because we then need more people to come together to decrypt transactions, but it's also getting much slower, so we cannot increase the number arbitrarily. Also, there are other considerations why we don't want too many sequencers. So informal description of the algorithm is that we want to mix the timestamp, so arrival time, with bits, uh, with a simple logic. Higher the bit, faster the transaction needs to be uh, scheduled, and also lower the timestamp, it should also be executed faster. Okay, so if we take, so if we mix bits with the timestamp, this will motivate the senders instead of spending resources on the latency improvement, which is quite expensive, ins instead of that, to bid. Also, we want to guarantee that no transaction can be outbid by any other transaction if G time passed. So you cannot buy more advantage than G. And G, we think, to be approximately half second. So that's a maximum what we add to the latency. And uh, we believe that uh, human users will not notice uh, much difference. But of course, uh, bots and programs will uh, see a huge difference. Okay, so our algorithm is, in my opinion, very simple. And it also has some fairness guarantees. It has all economic properties of first price all pay auction. So all pay auction means that uh, you cannot take your transaction back if you don't like the position of it. So once you bid, you need to pay for it, even if you lose the spot you want it. So your transaction is not the first in the race. And uh, yeah, it's incentive compatible in that sense that if you bid more, your transaction just gets earlier. And in case of back running, that's all you care. 
Because in front running, you also care that uh, transaction that you try to exploit comes in between your two transactions. But here, it's only about back running, so you just want to be as fast as possible. Okay, so we don't want to discourage people to send transactions earlier. So if you send earlier, you should get some advantage. But if uh, buying time is not too high, then you prefer to maybe wait slightly and then buy more time, so priority time. And we think that it gives chance to players who don't have high budget to have low latency, because it costs a lot, to sometimes at least win the race, especially when their valuation is high. Okay, so. With our algorithm, we also avoid a situation where there is a transaction that beats low, and right after it, there is a transaction that beats high, and the high transaction is executed later. And this you cannot avoid as soon as you have block-based approach. Because if you have a block-based approach, some transaction just makes it in the previous block, and then there might be a very high bit transaction that comes uh, quickly after, but it makes to the next time block. But with our approach, we have this continuous time, so we, we don't get such situations. Now, of course, we care about not sophisticated transaction senders because they constitute more than 95% of the transaction senders, or maybe even more. So when they send transaction and bid nothing, their transaction will be executed in at most G delay or more precisely, uh, after G delay. Okay, now more formally about the algorithm. We have a stream of transactions, so it's continuous time. We don't have a uh, time barrier there. So transactions just come one by one, and we maintain some score of them. But to calculate the score, we look at the timestamp that sequencer writes on the transaction. So the time that sequencer received it, and bid that is denoted by bi. So then we calculate the score si and post the transaction for the execution that has the highest score, and no transaction has a potential to outbid it. So that's also important. So now what is the score function? We have a function for the priority time, which is. G times bit divided by bit plus constant. So for this talk, uh, assume that constant is one, but uh, this is set by a system and can be updated uh, as the system goes. So if you think about C as one Ethereum, so that would mean that one Ethereum buys you 250 milliseconds extra, which uh, I don't think you can buy by improving the latency. So I guess uh, with latency improvement maximum, you can get maybe 100 milliseconds. Okay, then the score is the priority times minus t, or if you look at the dual problem, it's timestamp minus the priority time, but because we call it score, we want to maximize it. So this is the uh, negated value of uh, updated timestamp. Okay, so first result is that the only algorithm that satisfies independence of irrelevant races is the one that looks at the score function. So no other algorithm or any other algorithm you come up, we will come up with an example that it doesn't satisfy this property. But of course, uh, I didn't show why that particular score function is the one, because we could be just looking at the timestamp, that would be first come, first serve, we could be just looking at beats. That would be a bit weird because they, there is some time, so th there must be some at least waiting time. Well, of course, we can have block-based approach where we look at all the transactions that come in some time interval and sort there by beats. Okay? Or we can be looking at any other score function. But uh, regarding the choice of the function that we have, so first, uh, we have normalization. So we have few properties. So if you bid nothing, you don't get any priority. Okay, this is uh, very intuitive. Second was that property that no matter how much you bid, you cannot buy more than G time. So that's the second property. We want it to be increasing. So more you bid, 
more priority you get. And okay, so the last property is the concavity of the uh, score function. Uh, so this is more technical, uh, or the, it, it implies the convexity of the cost function, which tells that, uh, at least in our modeling, if you want to have equilibrium where higher valuations bid value, you need to have some, uh, some convexity of the cost function. Okay, if you take these properties into account, I think that the function that we have is the simplest one. But if you have some other suggestion for, uh, for a simpler function, I would be very happy to hear from you. Okay, so algorithm I briefly already discussed, but here it's um, more explicit. So we are posting the transaction with the highest cost as long as there is no uh, potential for other transaction to outbid it. Okay, complexities are very good here. Space complexity is linear. So we just look in some time interval to the transaction so we don't construct any additional table. And runtime is n log n, so as fast as, as it can be. Or okay, fastest would be linear, but we need to, at each step, find the transaction that has the highest score. So for that, this, uh, we need this additional factor logarithm. Okay, now let me <coughs> go through some uh, economic analysis. Suppose there is some arbitrage opportunity and players, uh, let's say we have two players, they need to decide on the technology, latency technology, and later maybe about the bid. Okay, suppose there is this cost function C that depends on the time, and of course, lower you want the time, so faster you want the transaction, more it costs. And these two users have some valuations for the arbitrage. And in principle, they are different. But we assume they come from some distributions of valuations. OK, so now we take the cost function that is 1 over t. But actually, it doesn't really depend on the functional form here. What matters is that if you want to be right after the opportunity arises, so your time is 0 it costs infinity. So you cannot be, physically speaking, right after the opportunity is there. But you can get arbitrarily close. It just costs, costs arbitrarily much. And the valuations are the same distribution for both players. But here also we can look at slightly different uh, val valuations. Also, a yeah, big assumption here is that we assume the independence of valuations. Is that there are two models that we look into. In the first one, players invest in the latency before they know the uh, arbitrage opportunity valuation. And this is the uh, yeah, most realistic one. First, you set up your system and your infrastructure, and then you learn about valuations from time to time. But yeah, so here we should think that uh, af after some time, you need to change it to so it's not for forever, so it's not one, one time cost you incur and that's it. So technology changes, maybe sequencer moves somewhere else, so you need to change. It only lasts for some time period. Okay, and in the other we look at the model where you can invest in, the, in both the latency and also bits after you learn about the uh, opportunity. Okay, so this, uh, Maybe less realistic, but there are some cases uh, where, for example, there is this 12 second block time for the Ethereum, and you saw some tr transaction that you know if it will be executed, you have some arbitrage opportunity. Therefore, you can condition with some service provider that if this transaction is executed in the, or included in the next block, then I, I want my transaction to be very quick. So that would uh, correspond to that case. Okay, but in both cases, bidding is uh, uh, interim activity. So you bid once you know the valuation. Okay, so this is a very simple game. First, we look only to the latency investment game, where more you invest, better your time is. So your strategy is how much you invest. And if you invested more than the other player, you are the one that wins. Then the 
The expected payoffs are written here, and this is this game has only one, so it has maybe m many uh, equilibrium solutions, but in any equilibrium solution, the expected payoffs of both players are zero. So they completely uh, exhaust each other. Thank you. Okay, now a slightly more interesting case is if one has lower budget than the other, situation changes. Again, we have maybe multiplicity of equilibrium, but in each equilibrium, the weaker player gets expected pay of zero, and the stronger player gets positive pay of, and this doesn't change, so this is quite robust. So the one that has uh, more resources always wins, basically. Oh, okay, so it's n it, in this equilibrium it does not always win, but it makes the weak player uh, win only very seldom, and the expected payoff is zero, while its payoff is positive. But this changes with the bidding. Okay, so now we add this to the model, bidding. Suppose in the first round they invested some levels, X1 and X2, then we know how much it costs to produce some score, sigma, so that's the score that uh, I, I was talking about. Okay, now the players solve an optimization problem. So they try to maximize their expected utility. And this is done by first order condition. And in the end we get a system of differential equations. So the functions map valuation into bidding or, or the other way around. The s signals into valuations. And we are not able to solve this system of differential equations analytically, but we can derive some properties. First case is very simple. If both of them invested the same in the first round, then we can even explicitly solve the functions. And in particular, we show that there is a completely separating equilibrium, which means that as the valuation increases, bid increases. So we know exactly what was the valuation depending on the bid. And they bid in every case, okay? And it gets much more complicated if it's uh, asymmetric. So if one player invested more in the latency in the first round, then there is some threshold below which none of them bid. So there is a pooling, there is no separation here. But of course the high, uh, low latency player wins or high investment player wins. But as soon as we are above this threshold, they start bidding. And from there on we have uh, full separation equilibrium. Okay, so this is more formal result. We can even find what is this threshold. It depends on the difference in the latency and on G. And yeah, so it's a lot of discussion here, but I don't have time for that. Main takeaway is that if we take G large enough, it approximates the uh, good case where we have completely separating equilibrium. So in the future work, we are thinking to add more players, which should not be a big problem. At least the insights that we obtain should generalize. Also, we are thinking to have more general cost function that should also not be, a, should not change qualitative results, but of course it will change quantitative. Uh, adding dependent valuations is also not very difficult. But also we want to estimate the valuations from the data instead of uh, assuming theoretically that they come from some distribution. And actually there is a lot of data about valuations. Uh, we try to compare it to the other alternatives and the first alternative is of course block based uh, auction. So we just take some time interval and sort the bits in that time interval. And so we want to have some easy algorithm to update the parameters, especially C. So if C is small enough, then we need to increase it because it's too cheap to buy the data. And if it's too high, we need to lower it because it's too expensive to buy the 
time. And G maybe not in the beginning. We think that half second is the good trade, gives a good trade off. And also we are interested in implementing and experimenting the proposal if our, our assumptions were correct or what can we improve about that. So thank you, I'm out of time. You so uh, I'll stay around a bit so you can ask me questions. Thank you.